Good morning, everyone. Please find yourself a comfortable chair. Sit down. We have uh, Dr. Dick Mackin with us this morning, and so you know that one professor to another, this is going to be a while, so be sure you're relaxed. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. All right. Welcome, everyone, to the Un Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Greater Naples. I'm Martin Parks, your worship associate, and along with Dick Mackin at the pulpit, music co-directors Abby and Sean Allison, musical guest violinist Ming Gao, our technical team Daniel Goodsit and John Forsyth, and our greeters, our ushers, and our amazing kitchen crew, we are all honored to be with you today. Though our minister, Reverend Tony Fisher, is away from the pulpit this morning, we are especially honored and grateful to welcome one of our own, Dr. Dick Mackin, as our special guest speaker. Born in Chicago, Dick became interested in the Middle East as an undergraduate and Northwestern, at Northwestern University. He earned his master's degree in Middle Eastern studies at Harvard and a PhD in Near Eastern studies at Princeton and spent a year in Cairo studying Arabic. He taught Middle Eastern history and politics at the University of Science in Penang, Malaysia. And for three years, he enjoyed a stint in the corporate world as a senior analyst for Middle Eastern affairs for the Gulf Oil Corporation, traveling extensively throughout oil producing countries. Finally, he served as a U.S. Foreign Service officer in Africa for 15 years delivering foreign aid through the Agency for International Development. Now, fortunately for all of us, in addition to Dick's inspiring words, we are also delighted to welcome Ming Zhao as our special guest musician. Ming serves as the Associate Concertmaster of the Naples Philharmonic and the Concertmaster of the Punta Gorda Symphony in the summer, he is the first violinist in the Chautauqua Symphony Orchestra in New York and has served as constant, a concert master of the Nanjing Experimental Orchestra in his native China. Today's guest musician is generously sponsored by Kathy Schneider in belated celebration of her August birthday. We look forward to sharing time with Ming Zhao this morning with a special thanks to Kathy. Dick and I wish to extend our welcome to you online, in the sanctuary, or on the pavilion. Thank you for joining us. If you are new to our congregation, our hope is to not only make you feel welcome, but to help you find ways to connect. Please leave your email address with us at the membership table on the pavilion after the service or on our website so that we can keep you updated on the many community building opportunities available to you here. Our worship team has planned an inspiring service for you this morning. As we begin, let's all take a deep breath, exhale slowly, and settle ourselves into this time of worship with this morning's prelude. Thank you. 
Thank you. That was very beautiful. A wonderful way to start the morning. Good morning. It's a privilege to be here with you this morning and share some information about the Enlightenment and the creation of our country by our founding fathers, who are greatly influenced by the ideas of the Enlightenment. Of all the faith traditions in our country, Unitarianism, Universalism, adheres most closely to the ideals of the Enlightenment. Now please join me in our cellist lighting response. <clears throat> in these challenging times, let us look first to the response of love. May our chalice flame bear witness to the inherent worth and dignity of every human being. In the midst of uncertainty, may our chalice be a beacon of encouragement that our values may guide our choices. Let us look first to the response of love. Thank you, Martin. Please stand as you are able for our opening hymn. Swords of the light expanding, law of the church that is to be, old bondage not withstanding, faith of the free, by thee we live, by all thou givest, and shalt give our loyalty commanding. Heroes of faith in every age, far seeing self-denying, wrought in an inward heritage, monarch and creed defying. Faith of the free, in thy dear name, the costly heritage we claim, their living and their dying. Faith for the people everywhere, whatever their oppression, of all who make the world more fair, living their faith's confession. Faith of the free, whate'er our plight, thy law, thy liberty, thy light, shall be our blessed possession. Our first reading this morning is There is a Larger Faith by Brad Carrier. There is a larger faith, a faith in nature, both outer and inner, a faith in our abilities beyond our fallibilities. It is a faith fashioned by philosophers and scientists, by freethinkers and artists. It is a faith of nature in nature as creation makes it, including us and our ability to know, love, protect, and further this good earth. It is a faith in our own inner nature, our reason and our conscience, our vision and resolve. It is a faith we have favored and furthered for over 400 years. Moreover, it is a faith enshrined in our country's very foundation, not just in the past, but in us as we find ways to live up to ourselves. We have just completed our opening hymn, Faith of the Larger Liberty, celebrating our liberal religious heritage. 
appreciative and inspired though we can rightly be by this. It is a song of the faith of all humans who seek to live up to themselves. When we use these abilities, when we live by compassion and ethics, when we delve into the mysteries and potential of matter, <clears throat> energy, life, and culture, we are living out loud our faith of the larger liberty. Now, Now let us remain seated um, while we sing our centering hymn, How Could Anyone, number 1053 in the Teal Hymnal, and the words are on the screen. We'll sing it through twice. How could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're connected to my soul. How could anyone ever tell you you were anything less than beautiful? How could anyone ever tell you you were less than whole? How could anyone fail to notice that your loving is a miracle? How deeply you're connected to my soul. How deeply you're connected to my soul. Each week during our service, we set aside this time for community, a time we come together to share our individual joys and sorrows, building bonds of love and understanding. Accordingly, at this time, we remember those in our lives who are struggling or those in our lives who are celebrating milestones. We send our joyful thoughts to Joanne and Jim Husky, who aren't here with us today, because they are celebrating the marriage of their daughter, Carolyn Meredith, to Peter Mack this very afternoon in Aspen, Colorado. Congratulations. Still, we grieve. It is with sorrow that we announce the passing of Alan Landreth this past Monday in Fort Myers after a long struggle. We send our loving thoughts to Alan's wife, Nadine, during this very difficult time. Yvette Stafford-Jones is working toward a full recovery after being hospitalized recently due to the onset of Bell's palsy. Significantly, Yvette and her partner, Lena, continue to participate in our weekend meals program through their Crohn's Charity Foundation. For further contact information for the Huskies, the Landreths, or the Stafford-Jones, please refer to the latest issue of Caring Corner newsletter or contact the UUCGN office. We also take this time to recognize those in the wider community who are ill, who have lost a loved one, or who serve others, we do hold them closely in our hearts. Regardless of the time you are joining us, now or later in the week, and regardless of how you are joining us, here in the sanctuary, on the pavilion, or online, please take a moment now to reflect quietly as Larry McCarthy lights this candle of community. Our meditation this morning is all that we share 
is Sacred by André Mall. As we gather together, may we remember when you share with me what is most important to you, that is where listening begins. When I show you that I hear you, when I say your life matters, that is where compassion begins. When I open the door to greet you, that is where hospitality begins. When I venture out to bring you to shelter, that is where love begins. When I risk my comfort to ease your suffering, when I act against hatred, violence, and injustice, that is where courage begins. When we experience the full presence of each other because of our shared humanity, because of our differences, that is where gratitude begins. May this space be a table that is not complete until all are welcome. May this table be a space of beauty where together we create a series of miracles and where all that we share is sacred.
Thank you so much. That was outstanding. Our second reading this morning is entitled Ithaca by Constantine Kafafi. It offers powerful insights to the notion that life is a journey toward the ephemeral, toward the ever-changing destination of becoming enlightened, to live in the moment as the best version of ourselves. As you set out for Ithaca, hope your journey is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. Lestragonians, Cyclops, angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You'll never find things like that on your way as long as you keep your thoughts raised high. As long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body, Lestragonians, Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul sets them up in front of you. Hope your road is a long one. May there be many summer mornings when, with what pleasure, what joy, you enter harbors you're seeing for the first time. May you stop at Phoenician trading stations to buy fine things, mother of pearl and coral, amber and ebony, sensual perfume of every kind, as many sensual perfumes as you can. And may you visit many Egyptian cities to learn and go on learning from their scholars. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you're destined for, but don't hurry the journey at all. Better if it lasts for years. So you're old by the time you reach the island. <clears throat> Wealthy with all you've gained on the way. Not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you wouldn't have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor... Ithaca won't have fooled you, wise as you will have become, so full of experience you'll have understood by then what these Ithacas mean. Let us stay together for a time. Let us stay together for a while. When the evening is approaching and the day is almost spent, let us say to one another for a time. All we have in common is the road. All we have in common is a journey. We are simply fellow travelers who are passing in the night. Let us stay with one another on the road for a time. <clears throat> Dare we trust a stranger with our dreams? Dare we trust a stranger with our story? If we cannot hide our fears, let us share our hopes and fears as we stay with one another with our dreams. All we have in common is a road. All we have in common is a journey. We are simply fellow travelers who are passing in the night. Let us stay with one another on the road for a Good morning. My topic this morning is the Enlightenment. Why should we care about the Enlightenment? 
There are a number of reasons, as you will see, that it should interest in us. The ideas, attitudes, and prejudices developed at that time are still with us and play a role in our lives. <clears throat> so what was the Enlightenment? It was really the beginning of the modern world. It was an intellectual and philosophical movement in Europe in the 18th century that valued the pursuit of knowledge obtained by means of reason and evidence of the senses. It emphasized reason over superstition and science over blind faith. It fostered ideals of liberty, progress, toleration, fraternity, constitutional government, and the separation of church and state. The Enlightenment provided the intellectual framework with, within which our country was born at the end of the 18th century. To understand what sort of country the founders had intended to create, we have to look at the ideas that were in circulation at that time. The central doctrines of the Enlightenment were individual liberty and religious tolerance in opposition to absolute monarchy and the fixed dogmas of the church. The movement emphasized the use of reason and science. People were seen as rational beings capable of using reason to gain knowledge. There was no need to rely on scripture or church authorities. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> there, was a, there was a belief that through their powers of reason and observation, people could make unlimited progress over time. Enlightenment thinkers viewed themselves as actively engaged citizens in a world ruled by reason. The founding fathers, especially the signers of the Declaration of Independence and the drafters of the Constitution, including John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and George Washington. John Adams was a Unitarian. The others were deists in one degree or another. Deism can be called natural religion, the acceptance of a certain body of religious knowledge that is inborn in every person or that can be inquired by the use of reason and the rejection of religious knowledge that is required through either revelation or the teaching of any church. The deists believe that God created the universe but remains apart from it and allows his creation to administer itself through natural laws. All supernatural aspects of religion are rejected. Hence the, the term nature's God in the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson put these ideas into practice in what he called the Jefferson Bible where he dropped all passages dealing with miracles, visitations of angels, and the resurrection of Jesus after his death. In that way, he tried to extract the moral code of the New Testament. Jefferson was a strong believer in the separation of church and state. In a letter to Danbury Baptist Association in Connecticut in January 1802, he stated that the First Amendment, which stated that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, built a wall of separation between church and state. Some scholars have argued that the wall, that the wall is rooted in anti-Catholic prejudice and the fear of religious influence on public life. <clears throat> this is strangely prescient because all five justices of the radical extremist right wing that has taken over the Supreme Court are Catholic. John Roberts, Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, Brent Kavanaugh, and Amy Conan Barrett. As with the overturning of Roe v. Wade on abortion rights, which was settled law for 50 years, 
They seem determined to change laws they disagree with ideologically. Forget about the law. Samuel Alito is particularly affronted by the secularization of American society and wants to return to the church-going 1950s. Amy Coney Barrett comes from, directly from the mother load of Catholicism, Notre Dame. The Christian nationalists, another growing danger, are on their side. The wall separating church and state is now under major attack. Now we have the in, a very interesting question. Was the United States founded as a Christian nation? Not according to our second president, John Adams. In 1796, a treaty was negotiated between the United States and the Muslim state of Tripoli in North Africa to assure the Muslim state that religion would not govern how the treaty was interpreted and enforced Article 11 of the treaty states, quote, the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion, end quote. Adams sent the treaty to the U.S. Senate for ratification in May 1797. The entire treaty was read aloud on the Senate floor and copies were printed for each senator. A committee considered the treaty and recommended ratification. The vote in favor of ratifying the treaty was unanimous. By their actions, the Founding Fathers made clear their primary concern was religious freedom, not the advancement of a state religion. Individuals, not the government, would define religious faith and practice in the United States. Thus, the Founders ensured that in no official sense would America be a Christian republic. The Declaration of Independence says that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the government, not from God. This brings us to the important question of originalism. Originalism, which is favored by the right-wing majority on the Supreme Court, is a legal concept demanding that all judicial decisions be, uh, be based on the meaning of the U.S. Constitution at the time it was adopted. Originalists contend that the Constitution uh, should be uh, interpreted uh, as the framers understood it. This is obviously a very narrow concept. The world of the 18th century is very different from our own. It is unreasonable to expect abortion or privacy to be mentioned in the Constitution. Their absence there doesn't mean that they're not important and valuable concepts that have developed over time. Moreover, when considering what the the founders would have thought, the intellectual world of the Enlightenment within which they operated should be considered. The founders, in some ways, were more progressive than some of the current members of the Supreme Court, who seem intent on introducing religion into all aspects of public life. Getting a religious exemption to almost anything now seems possible. This is something that the founders certainly would have strongly objected to. The idea of a racial hierarchy became established during the Enlightenment. The brilliant thinkers of Europe, proud of their achievements, put the white race at the top of the hierarchy. They were also knowledgeable about the culture and achievements of China, India, and the Muslim states across the Mediterranean. But Africa was a blank. While the outline of the continent was known, Nothing was known about the interior and the history and the culture of the people who lived there. So blacks ended up at the bottom of the racial hierarchy. 
now you'll see how slavery had a huge influence on how our country developed. By the time the founders met to chart the course of the new nation, slavery was already 150 years old uh, in the area that became the United States and was deeply embedded in society and the economy. I have to give you a warning here because the following discussion is probably now illegal in Florida classrooms under the creeping authoritarianism of our governor, Ron DeSantis, who touched a new low in political cynicism recently by flying recent Venezuelan border crossings from Texas to Martha's Vineyard at Florida taxpayers' expense. Were the founders racist? The short answer is yes. The nation they were creating was envisioned as a white nation. The problem was that the economies of the southern states were based on slave labor, where plantations producing tobacco, rice, and cotton required many laborers. The northern states did not need large numbers of slaves and began passing legislation to end slavery, Vermont being the first in 1777. Now here's some really astonishing uh, statistics, I think. At the time, the founders are thinking of establishing a white nation. But at the time the founders were drafting the Constitution, slaves made up 44% of the population of South Carolina, 41% of Virginia, and about a third of the, of the other southern states. So what were they thinking? How is a white nation going to come out of all of this when you have this huge black population in the country? The subject of slavery had to be handled very carefully at the Constitutional Convention for fear that the uh, southern states might withdraw. A compromise was found by counting each slave as three-fifths of a person for determining, determining population for representation in Congress. The terms slave and slavery are not found anywhere in the Constitution. The slave-owning states were interested in continuing the importation of, of slaves. And this is, this is the only thing in the Constitution that deals with slavery. And unless you know what's being talked about, you wouldn't get this from reading the language. Uh, in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 9 states, well, they, uh, after negotiations, they agreed that slaves could be imported for a further 20 years uh, into the country. So Article 1, Section 9 states, quote, the migration or importation of such persons, such persons being slaves, as any state now existing shall think proper to admit, shall not be prohibited by Congress prior to 1808, end quote. So slaves are referred to as such persons being imported into the country. Without allowing slavery to continue, the nation would never have come into being. Nine of the first 11 presidents owned slaves. The only exceptions were the two Adamses, John and John Quincy, who were both Unitarians. Thomas Jefferson, over the course of his life, owned 600 slaves, thought that blacks were inferior to whites and did not see them becoming equal citizens. He hoped slavery would be abolished someday, but once freed, blacks would have to leave the country. James Madison agreed with Jefferson that the only solution to the race problem was to free the slaves and expel them. The American Colonization Society was founded in 1816 to send blacks back to Africa in response to what was seen as a growing social problem 
by the increasing number of free blacks. The colonization effort proved to be a failure. Only a few thousand blacks out of millions in the United States emigrated to what became Liberia. I'm going to close by something which is, I think, very interesting. This is from Washington's farewell address of 1796. And uh, he seems to be, over the gap of 200 years, he seems to be speaking to our present situation. As I read this, see if anyone comes to mind. <laughs> Washington, listen, listen to this. I mean, this is, this, you, you could get this from television any day now. Uh, Washington wrote that partisan factions led by cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men distorted democracies by pursuing narrow agendas at the expense of the national interest. He goes on to say that, quote, designing men may endeavor to excite the belief that there is a real difference of local interests and views, end quote, by misrepresenting the opinions and aims of people of other states and regions. They tend to render alien to each other those who ought to be bound together by fraternal affection. That, and, and this, I think, is where um, over the space, you know, this voice from 200 years ago is, is giving us the real warning that we need to keep in mind. The greatest danger, Washington said, could spring from the chaos of a dysfunctional democracy compounded by relentless party warfare, if that doesn't describe today, I don't know what does, which would erode faith in the effectiveness of self-government and open the door to a demagogue with authoritarian ambitions. That's from, directly from George Washington 200 years ago. This was obviously a man of great foresight. Thank you, thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you, Nick. That was great. Um, I, I remember when I first got these notes from Dick and I started to go page after page after, you know how we do. And I thought, you know what, this is really good stuff. Yeah, so thank you so much. Very, very insightful. Now is the time for us to express the ongoing gratitude for this community, its work, its vision, and all the ways in which it nourishes our lives. Our offering allows us to exercise our generosity of spirit to support the work of the congregation through its many ministries to increase peace, justice, and love. For your generous spirit and for the impact it will have on the ongoing mission of this congregation, this morning's offering will be greatly received, gratefully received as well. And if you're watching at home, please consider sending a contribution today. The information you need is on the screen.
Thank you both so much. And Abby, we heard you in there too. Good. As always, there are many community activities to choose from at UUCGN this week. To begin with, for those of you who would like to find a way to connect and learn more about our congregation, please look for the visitors' welcome table on the pavilion after this morning's service and join the discussion. All visitors are encouraged to come to the table to ask any questions from a membership committee member or to get to know other recent visitors at UUCGN. Next, we are delighted to announce that a new art exhibit featuring the works of 10 UU members now is now on display in the Minerker Gallery, down the hall to the lobby of Thomas Hall. Stay tuned in the coming, week, coming weeks for additional details regarding a planned reception for the artists to be held on October 19th. Next week, after the service, we will be providing an especially timely program in voter empowerment with Kathy Ford, Kathy Gorski, and Janet Hoffman. These awesome women will help us learn more about recent election law, voter rights, how to learn about candidates, and how to get involved. A light lunch will be provided, so please plan to contact us by sending an email to office at uunaples.org if you would like to join in. The forum has returned. The kickoff forum of the year, co-sponsored by Taro, invites you to a presentation featuring Catherine Stewart, author of the highly acclaimed book on Christian nationalism, quote, the power worshipers inside the dangerous rise of religious nationalism, unquote. Catherine will be present virtually in our sanctuary and will remain available to address your questions. Please plan to join us for this timely virtual discussion immediately following the service on Sunday, October 9th from 12 to about 1.30. Please watch for a link to additional information regarding the forum in upcoming UUCGN newsletters. Finally, please look for the speaker's table on the pavilion this morning after the service. Our guest speaker this morning, Dick Mackin, has graciously agreed to join us to discuss today's message and explore the impact of the Great Enlightenment on today's world. Please span, uh, plan to spend a moment or two with Dick after the service this morning for an even greater understanding of this timely phenomenon. Know also that what with the current weather concerns, we ask that you confirm any planned activities over the next several days by watching your email notifications carefully and follow any updates as they are announced. Remember, the campus will be closed to all activity beginning tomorrow until the storm warnings have abated. Now, please, as you are able, please stand as you are able for our closing hymn, All Our Architects, number 288 in our gray hymnal, and the words will be on the screen. When the hymn is completed, please remain standing for our closing words.
The faith Im- embodied in the Enlightenment is that the process of becoming progressively self-directed in the development of both intellectual and moral principles leads us ultimately to a better, more fulfilled human existence. At UUCGN, we are held by the promise of that fulfillment through peace, justice, and love. Remember that promise and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much.